June 2, 1993, and the end of an era, as RAF Burdenwood closes for the last time. Burdenwood was probably the largest military base in Europe during World War II, and this film will serve as a memorial to all those who had the privilege to serve there. Originally, it was designed as a dual function base, an airfield with an RAF maintenance unit and an aircraft factory. The factory part was built first, with the airfield taking longer and trailing on behind. The factory is what we now know as BRD site, which still remains opposite to the American base. BRD stands for Burton Wood Repair Depot, but before it actually received that name, it was an amalgam of different companies, and there were companies such as Rolls-Royce, Roots, uh, Bristol Engines, there was a local Salford Electrical Company, and they undertook individual roles there of manufacturing aircraft parts, uh, harnesses, electrical harnesses, modifying American aircraft, and actually assembling some Bristol Blenheim aircraft here um, within the, the hangar area. It had everything, machine tools, and anything which was needed as a factory. And the uh, organization of it got rather complicated and it just didn't work so they combined all the individual companies into one organization known as BRD Limited, Burton Wood Repair Depot Limited and that became this limited company under the control of quite a character called Major Chichester Smith who was a first world war pilot and used to ride around the base with it being so large on his horse and a very well known character, quite a forceful character and he pulled it together then we started taking American aircraft for the Royal Air Force on the least lend basis and they were brought over to the UK. The single engine aircraft couldn't fly across the Atlantic so they uh, came on ships as deck cargo or in the holes but the larger aircraft could fly across. Now they had to be modified for RAF service and the first American aircraft to come in were actually destined for France. They had been ordered for France before the war started but with the fall of France, they were diverted to Britain into the RAF. So there were several early types like Brewster Buffaloes, um, Curtis Baltimores, Martin Baltimores, aircraft like those, came in for RAF service. And the civilian workforce modified them and prepared them ready for the, the RAF. And it was a happy-go-lucky place. Uh, the, um, they had a good canteen. The, at lunchtime, we were entertained either by uh, workers play time, our works wonders. Uh, there was a good social life outside of working hours in the town. And uh, I would think that most people enjoyed themselves while they were there. Mm. It was a bit um, uh, not very cohesive in, in the sense that everything uh, worked for the same thing. You worked for the various factories that you were employed by. Simultaneously, the airfield was being constructed, and it had five uh, sites around the airfield which comprised different hangars. There were 13 hangars altogether, and that was designated a, a maintenance unit, number 37MU, which opened on the 1st of April 1940. And the purpose of that unit was to take aircraft from the aircraft factories, uh, prepare them for service, whatever modifications were needed, paint them maybe, put radios in them, armament, armor-plated seats, um, adapt them for their specific role, and then store them ready for, for use by the squadrons. The Americans came in shortly after Pearl Harbor. They were looking for a base from which they could uh, support the 8th Air Force, which was specifically designed to be based in Britain for attacking Europe, attacking uh, enemy-held Europe. They needed a base which was going to be convenient to the States, so Burton Wood was ideal. It was close to the port of Liverpool, where ships could come in and it was a short uh, transfer from the docks to Burton Wood. Then the Americans took the whole base over, the BRD site, all 13 hangars, all five sites, and then they started building living sites. And they already had some constructed by then. Initially, they doubled them. There still wasn't enough room on the airfield, so they took over Bruce Hall, Canada Hall, Damhead Hall, all places which still exist in different guises in Warrington. Um, they were building up to a culmination of 18,500 American personnel on the base. And uh, with that number, plus all the bases controlled by Burton Wood, they represented about one-tenth of the whole of the 8th Air Force, controlled by Base Air Depot 
area, as Burton Wood was known. They came in large numbers, and as they came into the hangar or the office, they were looked slightly bewildered and uh, wondering where they'd come to. I suppose they hadn't been in England very long, uh, but within a very short time, a matter of weeks, the place was completely turned round from a uh, arch potch. It was, it was turned into an highly organised and efficient uh, working machine. The output of uh, engines within a, within a few months travelled, and the uh, uh, repairs to aircraft were, were done in a matter of 24 hours. The installation of special equipment was carried out uh, very quickly. And uh, it, it was incredible uh, that this should happen like that. Uh, the old atmosphere of the place uh, changed. You see, the Americans were in a hurry, in my opinion, and they wanted to get the war over. And there was going to be no old uh, ducks or uh, red tape or, or things of that nature that would impede anything towards complete production. And the role was to receive mostly uh, radial-engined aircraft like the Thunderbolt, uh, the B-17 Fortress, and they also took the, uh, the Lightning, the uh, P-38 Lightning. And the Liberator and the Mustang Fighter were mostly looked after at Wharton. But Burtonwood was the first to open. It was called Base Air Depot Number 1. And they would receive the bombers. They would come in mostly from places like Prestwick or Valley, where they had come across the Atlantic, made the first landfall on one of the extremities of Britain, refuel there, and then come into Burton Wood. Naturally, they travelled light across the Atlantic, and they came straight off the production line. So they were brought here and prepared for readiness for, for war. They'd be painted as and when necessary. Armour plating would be put in, especially around the seats. Uh, extra radio equipment, often extra guns. Quite a lot of modification work. And it worked like a production line. They would use certain hangars for certain jobs. And they would have a job of, say, 200 B-17 Flying Fortresses had specific modifications. And then when that job finished, they'd roll on to something different. And the numbers of aircraft grew dramatically, as everything did. It became a town. It became Lancashire's Detroit. It was nothing to have 500 aircraft on the ground at any one time. They were pushing out 1,000 aircraft within a month. They were turning over 2,000 engines stripping them down to their most basic components, reassembling them, test running them for five hours on the test rigs, and then putting them into boxes or putting them into the aircraft, ready to go off to the other bases, or if they were destined for aircraft here, then into those aircraft. There was aero engine hum over the whole of the area, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even Christmas Day. And they say the day they switched them off at the end of the war, there was this deathly hush over Warrington because the aero engines at certain would have been switched off. I was there about eight months, and I never found my way around it yet. It was so vast. I used to go there. I knew my way to Tinker Hall. That was like the main site. And the motor pool and Canada Hall. That was out at uh, Padgate, nearly. That was a wonderful place to live. You had uh, barracks with, you know, like four fellows to a, a room, and then your own wash basin, everything in there. Then uh, after that, I went and I lived over on Tinker Hall, which was the site six where the main work was going on but as far it was so vast i don't think anybody realized how large it was it stretched out well today it's uh what's merseyside isn't it cheshire and it was all lancashire in those days but there was a hospital at stockton all connected with burtonwood it was spread out all over the town everywhere <laughs> Plaza, the dance hall in Manchester in 1943, and I think he had only been in England uh, a couple of weeks at the time. And what did you think of him? I thought he was pretty nice. <laughs> I, uh, he didn't dance, that was the only thing. He wasn't a very good dancer. I didn't like that very much. 
but he was very nice. Being 19 years old, uh, we, we felt like we were probably a little bit wild, I think, back in those days. And uh, off the base, we sure did have a good time, I tell you. <laughs> a bit wild? I didn't think he was wild. <laughs> I know some were. I mean, you know, there was a lot going on in those days. But uh, I thought he was quite a gentleman yeah. myself. Well, the, girl, the girls, a lot of very nice girls, they, they'd never seen such good times. Of course, they were, a lot of them, they were brought up on rationing and then go to the parties in the mess halls and all this beautiful food. It was, well, just something they could, could not, couldn't believe. It was so fantastic for them. And, of course, the fellows were very generous with their money. They'd getting nylons through for them, and that was, that was quite a gift for them they couldn't i don't think they could even get a pair of stockings without uh, dockets or coupons here and of course the chocolates sweets candy if you like gum well the girls they enjoyed a good time well an awful lot of them used to meet at the railway stations you know that was the place that everybody knew they'd say well i'll meet you at the railway station of course and a lot of them were brought in by buses and in the ordinary army trucks they're brought in by the truckloads to the parties but they were they made them all go home the same way they arrived the fellows weren't allowed to travel home with them so it was quite quite well chaperoned really the base included its own 200 bed hospital there were cinemas and theaters on each site two dance bands played both on the base and at other centers such as canada hall and U.S. Red Cross clubs in Warrington, Liverpool, and Manchester, and many other venues. Many famous stars travelled across the Atlantic to England, and they all passed through Burtonwood, including Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, James Cagney, and Glenn Miller. The war in Europe ended in May 1945, and production here at Burtonwood stopped almost immediately and reverted into scrapping. And although the war against the Japanese was still raging and had several months to go, the American Air Force decided they didn't require the aircraft which were held in Britain. So aircraft which were in the process of being prepared for squadrons were stopped, they were towed out onto the airfield, and short term they were stored, and then they would have what they called a salvage program, and they would suddenly declare an area of maybe 500 aircraft surplus to requirements. So those aircraft would be literally systematically ripped to pieces. They weren't wanted, they were a war machine which nobody needed. They would put wire hawsers round the fuselage and pull them, cut them in half like a cheese cutter. They would put steel bars across batteries in wings and batteries would explode inside the wings to render the metal absolutely useless. They would cut the aircraft in half, turn it on its back so it was like a dead bird with its wheels sticking up into the air. And these were littered all over the airfield, literally as far as you could see all different types, fighters, bombers, communication aircraft, transport aircraft, didn't matter what it was, they were scrapping them. And the axemen came in with their pickaxes, and mechanical trucks came in and literally pulled these aircraft apart, and they stacked them sometimes five high. They'd have an area for wings, where you get wings ten high piled one above the other, another area where all the aero engines would be lined up, and they would go along systematically with a sledgehammer and smash every single cylinder so they couldn't be used again. And then they were sold off to the highest bidder for scrap metal. And the scrap metal merchants around Warrington must have had a heyday, but there must have been an incredible surplus of material. And the aircraft were brought in from other bases. Burtonwood became the last American Air Force base to close in Britain because all the facilities which were used on other bases, the equipment was brought into Burtonwood or it was sold or given to the British. It was not unusual for a base to have multi-million dollars worth of equipment lying there totally surplus and it would be just given away to the British government who then would either sell it off at auction or scrap it and it was mid to late 1946 before the last GI closed the door for the last time and went back to the States and handed Burtonwood back to the Royal Air Force. After two years back with the RAF the Cold War started and the blockade of Berlin commenced in 1948. Um, as everyone knows the American and British Air Forces supplied Berlin by air and needed a vast number of aircraft and by this time they had the C-54 Skymaster transport aircraft together with the Dakota and mostly the C-54 four-engined aircraft was used to ferry supplies into Berlin 
it was the Berlin airlift and it was taking place 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as the weather permitted. Now these aircraft needed overhauling and needed a major overhaul every 200 flying hours. And the American Air Force remembered Burton Wood. It was easy for American supplies to get to it across the Atlantic. They had all the maintenance facilities required here. So they asked if they could take it back. They were given the base back and in uh, September 1948, the advance guard of 30 Air Depot Group came across prior to the 59th Air Depot Group. Their role was to service these aircraft on a production line basis. The first one took about seven days to do. By the end of the Berlin Airlift, they could do nine aircraft in a 24-hour period. Several hundred man-hours were required on each aircraft, and these aircraft were costing lives when they were on the ground. They had to be back in the air. So Burtonwood went from being a very quiet salvage dump to back almost to a wartime activity. 5,000 plus GIs came back here, worked 24 hours a day, but in appalling conditions because the living quarters had suffered, the hangarage, everything had been allowed to fall into decay. And they really did suffer privations. They had to work right through the winter of 48, 49, keeping these aircraft airworthy. And uh, morale got very low indeed. But as they began to see their way out of the Berlin airlift and money was put back into Burton Wood, it began to gain or regain its uh, identity and uh, its presence. And they really spent a fortune on bringing the place back up into good order. The, by the end of the airlift, they had worked up into such a, an incredible uh, system of servicing that they then decided that Burton Wood would be retained to look after American aircraft, which were temporarily based in the UK as part of the NATO deterrent. Security measures are usually associated with a military checkpoint when cars are halted for inspection. But at the United States Air Force Base at Burtonwood, Lancashire, biggest in Britain, the accent is on road safety. Keen-eyed engineers examine more than 1,250 vehicles in this drive for road safety datelined Operation Lifesaver. During the mass overhaul, the smallest defects are pinpointed and unsafe cars rejected. Expansion in the 1950s included lengthening the main runway from 6,000 to 9,000 feet, building a new control tower which incorporated customs, shops and flight offices. Burdenwood became the gateway to Europe. On Site 3, so-called tobacco houses were built as part of the expansion of Burtonwood. They were part of a barter deal in exchange for tobacco and helped to relieve some of the poor conditions that GIs were living in at that time. Early trooping flights landed at Burtonwood and all incoming and outgoing US troops for Europe were processed there. The 53rd Weather Recon Squadron moved in undertaking weather flights up to the North Pole and across to the Azores, and probably undertook intelligence flights along the Iron Curtain. This is the header house constructed by the American Air Force in 1953 and finished in 1954, forming part of the expansion of Burton Wood, which included the extension of the main runway to 9,000 feet and the construction of the control tower and the new terminal. The concept of this building was to support the American Third Air Force in Europe and every conceivable item to support and to maintain an entire air force was stored in this building. It had a trolley system which ran on rails down on the ground here all the way around the building because it was so large and everybody cycles around here because it's just too big to walk around. The building was kept in use until the late 50s for the US Air Force when they began to run it down and moved the supplies from here to the individual active bases. was handed back to the RAF. They built dispersal points at the end of runway 27 to accommodate four Vulcan bombers. The base was to be used as a scatter airfield in time of emergency. 
burden wood was often used during nuclear exercises. In 1967, General de Gaulle took France out of NATO, and the huge stockpiles of US Air Force materials in France had to move. Burdenwood was reassigned in January 1967 as a US Army storage unit with materials for war, including vehicles, small weapons, mobile hospitals, MBC suits, Bailey bridges, medical and radio equipment. The 47th Area Support Group was formed and remained until close down. The main runway became the M62 and by the mid-1980s, the old airfield buildings were demolished, apart from a handful of hangars. Many veterans often return to visit the old airfield site, rekindling old friendships and old memories. Here we are, back at the old stopping grounds, where we used to have black hair at one time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just sit on the and we were watching our office. Oh, I think she'll have changed it. See, all these buildings are down. All your tech site buildings are down. Your Marianne site buildings are down, right where y'all were. Yeah, yeah. Where y'all were located. Where was Marianne site? It must be over here. Somewhere. You wouldn't know where you was if you got out there. The building would be so bad. You remember that? Yeah. I think quite painting where we're at. I believe that was tech site, yeah. It's hard, to, it's hard to realize that you can't see anything anymore, then, you know. It's hard to pinpoint where things were. You get here, you see the motorway, look across, then you'll see site A and site E, you remember that. Yeah. You remember those three hangars that had grass and all the time? You yeah. couldn't even see them. Right. Even when you're on the ground, you couldn't see right. them. That's still there, except they cleared up. And the other two hangars is what you call site A. Well, I left Burtonwood in 1958, October or November of 1958, and I was one of the last uh, people here in sense that uh, they were starting to phase down the American involvement with Burtonwood, and that's when I got reassigned. You, the control tower behind us there, fond memories? Oh, yes, it does. I learned to uh, play pinochle on the midnight shift working in that control tower and uh, learned quite a few other things in my stay in Great Britain. How has it changed looking around? Well, Great Britain is modernizing tremendously. Uh, uh, I, it bears no relationship to what it was when I was here back uh, in 1957 through 1960. Specifically, Burton Wood Base? Burtonwood Base is a shadow of what it used to be. It's, it just has no relationship at all. It was kind of a bustling activity then, and now it's just, just a shell of what it used to be. Some of the memories of your time on the base. Well, I remember quite fondly, believe it or not, one of the ladies who used to work in the dry cleaning establishment. She was, uh, I was a young man, and uh, she was, at that time, probably about the age I am now, and uh, she was kind of like a mother to me. She was a very nice lady, and I don't even remember her name. It was 30 years ago. <laughs> I, it's, everything has changed. I don't recognize anything <laughs> at all. You know, it's so different. I, we can't even locate where we are in, re, in relation to what, where we were when we were here, you know. Frank, your memories of playing in the band here? Oh, tremendous. Really tremendous. It was the greatest time of my life and, and a very educational one at that. And, and of course, playing with Eddie here, we toured up and down in the British Isles here quite a bit and played everywhere and we were so very well known here in this whole area. Now both of you together as people in bands like they are today you must have been a bit of a hit with the women. What do you remember of British women of those days? Oh <laughs> that's hard to say because we 
you know, as popular members of the band, you know, you had a lot of friends and women included also, but uh, that's, that's hard to say. How did the women react to you? Oh, you know, they, they liked it, American music, right, Ed? It's all about yeah, it. Yeah, and they liked, they liked the, the, the players in the band, too, you know. They liked all the arrangements that we made, you know. You know, in those days, it's different than today than it was then. Musicians used to be able to uh, impress girls with, with music and so on. It isn't like that today, you know. There's a different attitude completely. Different era, you know, Glenn Miller, you know, Tommy Dorsey in those days and what have you, you know. The people around here knew you as the Yanks who were overpaid, oversexed and over here. <laughs> yes. well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. You could say that. You, you know, really, I would have to say, because I was, I was a career Air Force officer, and, and, and my tours I had was 43 and 45, and I opened Birdwood back up in September 48. I brought a depot group back to, for the Berlin area. I moved in the same BOQ room at BRD I'd moved out of. So when you get to it, Burton Woods had a very important part in my life. We have, through the flight test, we're responsible for receiving all the aircraft. They'd go through for the modifications and whatnot. Then we'd receive them back. Then that's when George and the other uh, guys would get them all ready for me to test out and other test pilots. And we actually, in our period of time, from August 43 to VE Day, we put through 11,575 aircraft. And then, in August of 1944, our peak month, through right here, we not just test top, but we delivered 1,019 aircraft. Sort of record that they couldn't manage that, today. That, that, that was the record. We'd come kind of close, but when some reason, I don't know why, the flight test men, they told me they wanted to break 1,000. I said, oh, come on, it's too much work. You'd have to run them away at midnight. Get out of here. They wouldn't stop until we broke it. It's one of the best maintained uh, facilities, warehouse facilities that I've ever been associated with. Uh, the workforce, uh, one of the tops. Um, um, strategically, I think it's, uh, you know, my own opinion, is it's, it's a mistake that we shouldn't be closing. It's one strictly of economics and money and uh, everyone looking for the peace dividend. Uh, because there is so much going on in the world today uh, for the Americans to become less involved in, in world politics, um, no. Uh, it's, but it's become quite a challenge to the military to reorganize and restructure, to have the, the, uh, the force, if you like, uh, mobile force to put down just about anywhere in the world in order to combat any threat. And that's quite a tall order. And it's, uh, they're having some success that we, because of the, uh, the lessons learned in the, in the Gulf, uh, they've, they've made a lot of, uh, of good changes in the Army structure. It needed, it needed slimming down, and it could have been slimmed down. And it's happening, and unfortunately it is happening fast, but it's, it's within, not within our control. It's the politicians that are controlling that. Again, my personal opinion, I, I think uh, there's, there's a need, would be a need for a Burton Wood in the future. Uh, the, the British and the Americans have been such strong allies uh, over the years, that, uh, and we are so close, and we, we share so much in the foreign policy arena that um, I could see still in the future a need for a place like this. I can see from, from where I am uh, the excellent work that was done here. Um, I really hate to see it closed because like I say, the equipment that was here was in excellent shape. The supplies were in a very good storage environment. Um, we have things that have been there for, for many, many years, and uh, the condition has not deteriorated. Um, a well-trained workforce, um, and should that be needed again, it takes a long time to start that up. Many years to, to get to that same level of, of quality of workforce that we had. Um, so if it's needed, it's... Um, 
we, we won't have it. Um, but yeah, I hate to see it close because for all of those reasons, it's, um, um, I would put that workforce up against any anywhere in the world. I think, um, you know, the work that they produce is absolutely excellent. Distinguished guests, friends of Birdwood, the U.S. Army presence here at Birdwood since 1967 has been part of the overall NATO mission to win the Cold War. That mission has been successfully completed, and now the U.S. military, as well as the military of other countries, is being significantly reduced in size. The United States Force first came to Warrington in 1942, and since that time, RAF Birdwood has been home to countless thousands of American personnel and their families. We have worked and played side by side, and the warmth, kindness, and generosity which you have given so freely during our stay has founded many long-lasting friendships and, in many cases, families. For this, we sincerely say thank you. For this friendship such as these that will stay close to our hearts, regardless of where we are in the world, the people of this community have given much and asked nothing in return. As I would say farewell, I would like to wish you health, uh, peace, and prosperity in years to come. God bless you all.